Open your Bibles to Matthew 24. Verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. It was not that many years, only a few decades after Jesus said these words that that came true. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? That's question number one. Question number two, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? And then question number three, and the age, not age, and the end of the world. So they had really three questions in that one verse. And I've preached on this before, I'm not going to review that. Verse 4, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many have come and gone, and the seed, billions, if you really think about it. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, all these things happened in the last 2,000 years. But the frequency and the vast amount of people that are involved in the nations have increased exponentially. For nation shall ride against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. There have been famines throughout history even before Jesus said these words. We read about famines in the Old Testament. But the question was, when these things shall be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus was saying, these are the things that are going to happen after after He would depart before his coming again. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence. Pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. The word pestilence there in the Greek be trans translated plagues. In some Greek translations, you find and plagues in diverse regions. Now, Ebola could be one of those. And you know what the funny thing, not funny, but you know what the strange thing about it is? Ebola is not even the most deadliest that we know of. There's deadliest, deadlier plagues type viruses that are out there that are even more destructive than Ebola. Kingdom against kingdom, there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. Now, 
I don't think anybody living on this planet doesn't know that there's been wars and rumors of wars. And it seems like it's getting more frequent. Every decade that goes by for the last hundred, uh, ten decades. Nation against nation, everywhere around this planet. The news just covers the major nations, but every nation around this planet. Nobody even talks about what Pakistan and India and how close they've been to all-out war, both nuclear powers, many times in the last few years. North Korea, South Korea, China pushing and see how far it could push the envelope. I'm not even talking, I'm not even going to get into all the different nations in the Indonesia area and South Asia area, south of China, with their own civil wars within their nations and against other nations. Ukraine has always been, been in the news for the last four or five months, not to mention all the civil wars taking place in Africa. Wherever you turn, it seems to be getting more frequent, especially the last two decades. Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, and now ISIS. The only thing we hear in the news lately is either ISIS or Ebola the last week or two. And let me tell you, friend, we have elections coming up in this country in November. More seat polishers running for office. Do nothings, in my opinion. That's expected. Not to mention, you'll be having, we'll be having in this country another national election. We'll be voting for president, a new president. And from now until then, all these politicians in this nation will be saying one thing. But the actual fact of the matter is this world is not becoming safer. No matter what they tell you. And how their policies will make it a safer place or their policies will change the viewpoints of other nations towards this country. Or any other country. This world is becoming seriously dangerous. not peaceful, no matter what politician speaks concerning what's happening, trying to convince you that we're making progress in the world and helping the world to get along and be more peaceful with each other and with us. Yeah, right. What about these earthquakes? They have, I necessarily don't believe they've grown in frequency. It's just we became capable and we've pretty much plastered this world with technology to be able to detect these earthquakes. So it's really a combination of both. I believe they've increased, but they also increase because we know more about the earthquakes and when they're happening because of the technology, technological advances, <clears throat> especially the last 20 years. Excuse me. All these signs we read here in the scriptures are just warnings. Jesus said these things would happen. And when these things happen, take heed. It's like a trumpet announcing 
something's happening. You better listen. You better pay close attention. If you're not saved, now's the time to have that change of mind concerning Jesus Christ. If you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, keep faithing. Keep trusting in Him to get you through whatever you have to get through and keep you spiritually in tune with Him. Because no matter what happens in this body, we're guaranteed eternal salvation with a new body. Now, mainstream media has put the fear into individuals and becoming very afraid because of pestilence or the plague, Ebola. Now, Jesus said, I think, I think his words are plain and clear that during the last days of human history, there would be a pestilence. Or there would be pestilence. And there has been to different degrees. Some of the diseases that modern science thought they had eradicated, for instance. Tuberculosis. Smallpox. Others, they've returned. And what they really don't tell you, they have mutated. People even in the medical field don't even get the, med the information that's important to know. They have somewhat mutated. So they're trying to figure out how to deal with that. And deal with this slight mutations. So they can keep the population from being diseased. What I call these plagues. And now Ebola virus. Like I said, it's all over the news. Most thought it was just an African problem. Well, that's changed, hasn't it? There's signs of it in Europe. There's people that have become infected in Africa, flown back over here into the States. One just died before it came on live a few hours ago. In a Dallas hospital with this Ebola virus. See, they thought it couldn't be transmitted unless by touch. But now they're saying that it can be transmitted through the air from a person's cough. Or you can pick it up on surfaces because the virus lasts up, for several, lasts up to several hours after making contact with that surface. Those of you been hearing the news or reading anything about it, this is nothing new to you. Just give you one example. I'm not trying to put fear into you because my message is of hope and faith when I get to it. But I don't believe in conspiracy theories either. I like to stay in the probabilities and the facts and then move on to faith and how to deal with it. What if that individual that came from Africa lived in the Dallas area? For instance, being infected, what if he went to an ATM? And if that ATM had a covering which the sun is blocked because if the sun hits this virus, it kind of just disappears fairly quick. 
But if it doesn't, it can live up for hours. And ever what it makes contact with. What if this person went to an ATM that was covered by the sun, for instance? Because a lot of these ATMs, I don't know what it's like in Texas, but here in California, you have drive-up ATMs, you have walk-up ATMs, but a lot of the drive-ups are covered. Even the walk-ups are covered. And a lot of them don't have direct sunlight. What if someone's infected and walks up to an ATM? And how many people after that? And how many people that touch this infected area then touches something else or someone else and so on and so on? It starts like this and it grows like that quickly. So I understand why people are a little fearful. And I understand why they have to be cautious. Because the probability is there. And this country is still very slim. In a country like Africa, especially Western Africa right now, it's not so slim. Of course, you can see a lot of examples of if you get in a plane, if someone's infected, they cough, they touch something, whatever. How many other people will possibly be infected by it? When they get home and they touch loved ones or friends, and, you know, the number is staggering how <coughs> it can grow and become seriously dangerous awfully quick. This is from the CDC website. This is not something I'm making up. This is from their website. I don't know if they still have it up there, but I got the information. The rate of disease symptoms and mortality or the death of an infected person approaches near 100% if unchecked. Now let's make some hypothetical math equations. If we take what has happened in Africa to their population, it has been mathematically calculated that compared to the country of Liberia, which has a population of 4.2 million people. And if we examine what it would be like if calculated to the population of the USA, for instance, if 3,692 cases of Ebola have been diagnosed in Liberia, and of those 3,692 cases with a fatality rate of 54%, or 1,998 people have died in Liberia alone, of that number, 3,692 represents 0 0.0086 of, the, of their population. Now, if you take those numbers, and if that same infection and death rate were applied to the United States, Ebola would infect 269,000 people, and of those, 156,281 would die. Now, if as doctors and scientists fear the basic reproduction rate rises to two in Liberia, the numbers change very quickly, very quickly. Using the mean average incubation time of nine days, it would take around 13 weeks for the entire population of Liberia to become infected. Ten doublings start with 3692 equals just under the population of Liberia. This multiplied by nine days gives us 90 days, which divided by seven gives us 12.85 weeks. Of the 4,290,000 people infected, 2,316,000 would lose their lives. Translated to an equivalent outbreak in the United States, where their basic reproduction rate is also 2, the numbers are horrifying. 
starting with patient zero, it would take around 245 days, 35 weeks of every person in the United States to become infected. Of those, 171,180,000 people would die. That's 27.17 doublings times nine days equals 245 days, which equals 35 weeks. These are figures that are pulled from the CDC website. I didn't make this up. So if these percentages are correct, and if they are applied to the USA, United States of America, in this country, you can see a pandemic like we've never seen before. You can apply the same figures almost to the area where most of Western and part of Europe, Eastern European individuals reside in the European continent. Now, if I was an individual and I was reading that CDC website, it would scare the bejesus out of me. If I didn't, didn't know the Lord and I was saved and I understood what his rightly divided word says and what promises I have. And these are the promises that we got to hold on to. In faith no matter what happens. I'm not saying this is the facts and this is what's going to happen. I'm saying the probabilities are there. i convinced but what I have studied and read concerning the Western African countries. For instance, in Liberia alone, more than 3,692 individuals have died. That's just the individuals that have reported to the medical authorities in that country. That is not even taken into account of the ones that don't. Because many people in that country don't believe in modern medicine. They're still very involved in witchcraft type medicine. So what do we do? We claim his promises. Those who are faithing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, you take your precautionary methods that you practice. Hygiene, for one, is very important. Washing your hands. For instance, very important. But after you take all those precautionary measures, you still could find yourself in a state of fear if you don't have the Lord in His Word to give you confidence. of what he's promised if you trust in him. And just to understand what he says, we have to look at Psalms 91 tonight. Now this is a psalm that was written. It was a psalm that was given just before Moses died when he was addressing the children of Israel for the last time before his death. The last time I checked, by the way, the United States of America is part of the children of Israel. Those of you who've been listening to me already figured that out before I even said it. I'm going to read the whole psalm. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. No safer place, by the way. 
I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise, noise, noisome pestilence. Noisome some pestilence. So that word noisome. The calamities of life. Why well, don't I write this down next to this word? The Hebrew has an expounded expanded, excuse me, definition to this word in the Hebrew language that means several different things, but the calamities of life which require refuge in God for protect, protection. I'll read that to you again. Destruction, and the calamities of life which required refuge in God for protection. Noisome pestilence. A pestilence is going to require God for your protection because He is our refuge. I'm claiming that. No matter how cautious I am, during flu season and cold season, I'm pretty cautious not to try to touch or be around people. If I am around people, I'll take all the precautionary measures to protect myself. But lo and behold, you get sick anyway. Well, we got promises for pestilence. Pestilence, by the way, in the Hebrew, always describes something that came with death and destruction. And that's what Ebola is like. It brings destruction and eventually death. Well, I got news for Ebola. And this is our promise. I have someone that I can run to as my refuge because his promise that he would be my protector. And he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall they trust. Shall they trust? It's a word that means to flee for protection. We shall flee for the covering which his feathers will provide us because we're under his wings. And we're protected because we flee to him. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Well, you've heard me say this before, I don't say it that often, but what is our, one of our promises of God? That no weapon formed against us shall prosper. As far as I'm concerned, Ebola is a bioterror weapon. No weapon formed against shall prosper. But here's the truth of the matter, whether you like to hear this or not. This promise is not for all humanity. This promise is made for the child of God, for the disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. It's not given to all humanity. It's given to the redeemed and the disciple who walks with God. It might sound cruel, but that's why you need a change of mind in these last days. Many things are going to come at us from every direction. 
need to be in Christ. So when they do come at us, we don't operate in a state of fear, but in a place of faith and trust because we know who we need to run to under his wings. And he shall be our protector, our shield, our buckler. And verse 5 says it's very clear. Thou shall not be afraid. For the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the what? The destructive death that pestilence brings that walketh in darkness. And that's what plagues are like. You don't see them unless you go under a microscope. You don't see them. The Hebrew is very clear, a very thick darkness because we're blinded to them. We don't see them. We don't know if it's here, there, or there. So you live yourself in a bubble? Or as a feather of Jesus Christ, you say, I'm under the wings of my master. His feathers covered me. He's my shield and buckler. I will put my trust in him. Nor for the pleasant that walked in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. That Hebrew word for destruction carries a, a double meaning also. That destruction can bring be the cause of your death or that destruction be the cause of your salvation. Unfortunately, there's too many people that do get seriously ill with Ebola or anything else. And they know their days are numbered. And they realize, now what? Some will be the cause of their destruction, and unfortunately eternal destruction, and some will, even though it's the last minute of their lives, will run for that covering that Jesus Christ provides. And that would be the cause of their salvation. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. I'm claiming for that for myself, my family, for HOFs, for our participants in this ministry, to every disciple in, of, in, of Jesus Christ. A thousand shall fall at thy side, our side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh thee. Verse 9, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, Neither shall any plague come nigh upon thy dwelling. See, God's shown us what's coming in Scripture. And he's given us his word to combat the coming, I believe, man-made problems. In all these, in Matthew 24, 8, it says these are all the beginning, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Everything that led up to Matthew 24, 8. The pestilence, the earthquakes, nations against nations, wars and rumors of wars. We're seeing all this played out in our present time.
But I'm telling you tonight, claim this promise along with me in God's word. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Let's look at that verse. For he shall give his angels. Now that's one of those Hebrew words that can mean angels. But it also means human messengers. I think it means both here. For, all, for he shall give his angels and human messengers charge or order and command over thee. For what purposes? Because angels ain't going to be speaking in your ear besides what some of you super spiritual ones think. So that's why the human messengers have to come in. And to bring faith back into the land. So they're preaching the rightly divided word of God. And through other field that he uses to bring hope instead of fear. For he shall give his angels charge or order and command over thee to keep. The Hebrew is very clear. It's not just to keep, it's to watch, care, and keep. What? Thee in all thy ways. If the angels by themselves, for you super spiritual ones, could do all that and keep us in all thy ways, then we wouldn't need much of God's word, would we? The angels are doing all the work. That's not what this verse means. It has a bigger application than how most people see it and preach it. I believe in a supernatural, unseen protection, but I also believe in what God's given us, the information through His Word that needs to be preached to give people the faith and hope of why they should run under the wings of the Father and the Son so they have a covering against all the evil that's out there, including plagues and pestilences. The angels have their jobs, but the human factor is also important here because they keep watch, care, and keep of you. That's why I get most bad at most pastors that don't even understand that. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest they dash thy, thy, dash thy foot against the stone. They shall thread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shall they tr thou trample on their feet. Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Here's the promise. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. This is not saying I'm going to have no problems. This is not going to say I'm going to have no sicknesses. We're dealing with in two different sections here, pestilence and plagues. Three different sections, actually. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver. Circle that word. I will deliver him and honor him. Circle that word deliver. What does that mean? It means I will, and the Hebrew makes it very clear what it means. If you study all the application of the word that's being used here, I will deliver. I'll circle that. It means I will equip. I'll just say him or her. I will equip him or her for war. For the fight. You can also use. <laughs> that's our promise, folks. He will equip us 
for war. Why do you think it's so important? And I spend so much time, and I'm still not done, on Ephesians 6, about the whole armor of God that He makes for you. It's a spiritual suit designed for you and you only. We all have one that trust and faith in Jesus Christ. I will equip you for war or for the fight. And that's not all. With long life or length of days, is a better translation, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I skipped a part in verse 15. Let me go back to it. I will equip, equip him for war for the fight and honor him. A type of honor which shows that we prevail in the Hebrew. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Go to 2 Timothy. And I'll finish there tonight. Second Timothy chapter one verse seven. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, a dynamic power, by the way, and of love and of sound mind. Now repeat this. Promises made to the disciples of Jesus Christ, the children of God, the redeemed, men and women and children who walk with Him daily. Now you'll be bombarded by the news. And yes, I believe you should take precautionary measures. You should do that anyway. Who wants to be sick with anything? Don't let it rule your life. Let faith rule. Let God's word take over and fill you with a sound mind because we're not given the spirit of fear but of the dynamic love. He's already proven his love for us, I think. I know. He doesn't prove it anymore. And if he did that 2,000 years ago, so anything he said in what we read in Psalm 91 about how he will care for us against these pestilence, I believe his word could be trusted because it's truthful. And he's not a man to lie. And the news media will run its course. And I don't know how serious it can get. In fact, it doesn't matter who you believe. The facts are starting to come out. The CDC in this country is trying to license a, a vaccine if they can find one and create one. And that means instead of being privatized, it would be a government program that will make money from the pharmaceutical end of it. And when it comes right back down to it, money seems to always talk and drive people to do certain things in itself that's evil in itself because the spread of fear will probably cause people to take vaccines that have not even been tested in the normal 7 to 15 year range to prove what the, for instance, the side effects would be. 
from this vaccine. We're a world gone crazy and no country is excluded from it. And not to mention there's possible light at the end of the tunnel, which I'm not gonna get into tonight, that a pharmaceutical world does not want you to know about even cases with Ebola. Because there's no money to be made in it. We live in a world that's gone evil and out of its mind. And they'll constantly try to put the spirit of fear in us, but we have the dynamic love of God and its promises, a sound mind. And if we get fearful, remember to run underneath his wings because he's our shield and buckler. And under that kind of protection, I'm trusting and faithing in God that Ebola doesn't stand a chance. That's my view. Whether you agree with it or not, I'm standing on this. Now, I want to hear from you. Play a song.